So our next speaker will be Mr. Angad Singh here, uh, presenting on Python Pens, a build system for large code bases with multiple dependencies. So uh, Mr. Angad is actually a leading infrastructure and operation team at Vicky Rakuten, and previously he worked as a site reliability engineer at Twitter. He's passionate about infrastructure automation, monitoring, distributed system design, and development productivity. So that's why our hands to welcome Mr. Angad. Thanks for joining. I know it's uh, right after lunch, and you guys might be sleepy slightly. It's okay. I I, I allow sleeping in my bed. <laughs> so, so if you if you feel sleepy, you can just raise your hand and let me know. And yeah. <coughs> yeah. Okay. So let's uh, let's start. Uh, my name is Angad, as as uh, as the intro introduction uh, mentioned, and today I'm going to uh, tell you about build systems for large code bases. So, uh, hang on. Yeah. Uh, so I graduated from uh, NUS Computer Engineering in 2013. Attended many lectures in this room. Uh, I was an SRE at Twitter after graduation for one year, and then I uh, joined uh, Wiki in Singapore as the as a DevOps uh, engineer. Uh, so, so first thing that I'm going to uh, let, let's get the agenda straight. So first thing that I'm going to talk about is code organization uh, and for large code bases, and then like how do we uh, solve some pain points uh, to improve developer productivity. <coughs> We will go over how pants can be used as a build system uh, and how it e generates easily portable PEX files. Uh, and then we'll go over some code examples about pants and just some repository examples about how we structure code. Uh, so I might be uh, talking about pants here as a build, as a build uh, tool, as that's, like, that's the one that I'm mostly familiar with, and it's uh, written in Python. But there are other build tools as well, uh, such as uh, there's Buck by Facebook, Bazel by Google. Uh, so I urge you to explore all of these tools. And uh, the main uh, concept being that using a build tool is better than not using one. Right? So you should explore all of these. Uh, so let's start with code organization. So let's say you are a small team or, or a small startup. Uh, the most intuitive way to organize code is to, is to have a project repository per service. Right? So you can have, like, let's say, one service is the user service, and you have a repository called users. You have one payment engine. You have a payment engine service, right? So you ha you, you divide your code into blocks as as uh, as just as you divide your uh, service uh, just as you divide your microservices, right? The so the the, uh, the idea behind microservices is a great idea, right? I mean, you can have uh, all your teams working independently on different pe different pieces of uh, the infrastructure. They can uh, you can do different deploys at different times. You can deploy users code. You can deploy your API. You can deploy some API changes in the front. Right, but but that does not mean that microservices should be micro repositories as well. Right, your microservices should not map to micro repositories. Uh, it is it is an opinionated thing to talk about when I when I say all of this. So take this all take all of this with a pinch of salt because these are all opinions and uh, they all work in different in different scenarios. Different uh, opinions work for different people. Right, so. Uh, Split, so when you, so a lot of uh, companies are now going from the idea of splitting a monolith into uh, microservices, right? So the most intuitive way, the first thing that you think of is, okay, I have these services. Let me pull out the code for these services and put them into individual repositories. And that's the simplest answer. In fact, uh, recently you guys have seen that uh, GitHub is offering unlimited free private repositories. So why not? Why not create multiple thousands of repositories, right? So as a small team, that's okay. That that works good. You have uh, separation of concerns, but as teams grow, both in terms of age as well as uh, in terms of team size, uh, you 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 tend managing these thousands of micro repositories. It's, it's, it becomes a pain. Managing microservices is uh, can be automated, can be handled, right? So why not do something for this uh, in this scenario as well, where you manage your uh, where you automate your management of micro of these repositories. So as I mentioned, so. Uh, one of the main uh, reasons I say that uh, it, it can be painful is because a lot of these services might have some shared code, right? Uh, for example, uh, some service might have a special way of connecting to a Redis, right? Uh, they might say that, okay, after three retries, I don't want to retry again, right? But all of these are configuration parameters that can be supplied to a library, right? So technically, all of these services should not be re-implementing or re restating all of these basic logics, right? So so this is where I say that's the shared code, right? So if you have shared code in multiple uh, repositories and multiple teams are managing these repositories, 
it turns out that all of these people might be doing it differently, and you, you end up with a lot of messy standards. That's, that's one way. The other way is you can publish these shared code as some sort of artifacts, maybe jar files, or maybe you can publish them as uh, some uh, uh, Ruby gem, or, or, or in case of Python, you can publish them as eggs, whatever you want. Right? Uh, but then all the other services import them by doing versioning, but then you end up in a version hell. Right? You have so many down, let's say I, have a, uh, I, have, I maintain a library and there are so many downstreams, there are like 50 downstreams, 50 downstream services that are using that, uh, 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 my, my code, and I want to make a tiny function change, ti like, like a tiny change that does not change the API, but it changes, but it adds some improvement. Now I have to go in all of the other repositories and make that change. Right? That's definitely a productivity nightmare. Right. So, so it does not. So, to my idea is that it does not scale well for a large number of microservices, and you you end up with some complex methods of sharing libraries, uh, publishing artifacts, versioning hell. So, let's. Uh, so, I invite you to think of uh, code, code unit, not as projects but as libraries, right? So, there's no special definition of unit of code, but I'm defining one here, which I call library is the unit of code. Right. Now, so now each of the services, so let's say we divide our code, uh, code into a bunch of different libraries, right? and each of the services are composed of these libraries with overlapping libraries amongst multiple services. Right? So the idea behind that, if you, ha if you start with this mindset, uh, then you promote the idea of writing reusable and shareable code directly from the start. Right? So uh, you, you say even even if that module might not be intended to be reused later on, you you start with a concept that hey I will make make sure my code is uh, is individually testable and can be exported into another uh, project that that might need it. So so we think of libraries as units of code. The good the other, there are lots of other benefits of uh, going with this approach. Uh, you, you get single, like a single lint build, test, and release process that can be baked into this repository. Uh, they're easy to coordinate changes across multiple modules. Uh, easier to set up development environments because the, all the development environment tool chain is present inside this repository where you can, uh, it can uh, set up all of these services together for you. Uh, tests, uh, so let's say you change one shared library and if, if that library has changed, it will run the test for all the, all the uh, services that are using that library and run the tests for all of them. Right. So this is not a, a very new concept that I'm introducing here. This is an existing concept that a lot of uh, uh, other companies have uh, used in the past. And uh, so it's, it's, it's called the monorepo. Uh, there are pros and cons of this. A uh, lot of people argue against monorepo and a lot of people argue for monorepo. Uh, so I define monorepo as a repository with a defined structure for organizing reusable components of your code. So uh, it started with uh, Google. So Google has a famous uh, very large monorepo in which uh, they, use a, they, they have this uh, system called the Bazel with which they extract certain pieces of the code whenever a developer wants to work on them. Right? But the good thing is that they have standardized their tooling all around that. Uh, tooling around, uh, all around that. And it prevents, uh, it prevents uh, re-implementation of or like reinventing the wheel every time you start a new service. Uh, you get all the benefits that other services have. For example, uh, if you start building, if you start building a service with, within this monorepo, you will get monitoring for free. You'll get profiling for free because it has it is already part of the build process. It is already part of the tooling, right? Uh, so, and the success of large engineering teams depends heavily on building on top of the work of people that have worked in this company before, right? You you keep on building uh, on top of uh, other people's code. So, so now we know that there are some there's some benefits of thinking if, if codes as libraries and organizing your code in such a system where, where it's all present in one place, right? So in summary, so we, so we need a system that allows easier code sharing amongst multiple projects. And uh, as mentioned, fixing a bug in a function should not require changing versions of other downstream projects. Uh, we need standardization and testing and building process, right? And let's talk about Python, right? So, so I'm pretty sure a lot of you have used virtual environments in Python, right? And virtual environments to manage dependencies of a single Python project is very easy. You have your virtual environment. But if you have multiples in like tens of twenties of uh, projects in your, uh, in your repository, managing the virtual environments is going to be painful. 
Right? So we need some way to automate this process. We need some way to automate the building of your virtual environments. So, so that's where uh, Pants steps in. So Pants, it's actually Pants. Right. So, so it is a build system. Uh, it is a build tool with support for multiple languages written in Python. Uh, it was developed at Twitter and Foursquare to manage multiple build targets in a single uh, repository. Uh, it, it, uh, the dependencies are managed in build files, so th think of build files as your make files uh, that live alongside the code. I'll, I'll touch on build files in a bit. So let's <coughs> talk about the history. Why is it called Pants? Why is such a weird name? So it used to be a Python wrapper around Java Ant, the, the famous Java build tool. Uh, and it used to generate just the build.xml file that used to be consumed by Ant. Right? So, it, so Python plus Ant is Pants. Right? So that's why it's called Pants. Uh, it's just a weird name somebody came up with. Right. Uh, then it was later completely rewritten uh, to be an independent build tool with main support for JVM languages and Python, though the other languages are also supported with, uh, with plugins. So let's go some uh, basic concept of Pants. Uh, so first thing is uh, you, you define a source tree. So source tree is your basically your, mo your mono repo. Uh, and inside it, you have a source folder, SRC. And inside it, you have multiple languages, let's say Python, Scala, Java, right? Uh, inside the source tree, uh, each of the leaf nodes is your target, right? You want to build the targets, which are the leaf nodes, right? Uh, and build files define the targets at each, each leaf node in, this, in the source tree. We'll come on, we'll, I'll talk more about build files later on, so if you don't understand this part, that's fine. So, build, so the build files are written in a specific DSL. Uh, that is, uh, it, 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 looks it looks very similar to Python. Uh, it's very simple. Uh, it has some basic functions. Uh, it basically invokes uh, some Python constructors in the, in, the, in the Pants project. So when we talk about targets, so what do we mean by targets? Uh, so when you have a, a multiple services, what does a service mean? Service is a process, right? So a process starts from a binary or some sort of uh, like some, some sort of a process, like it's, you, you, you start from some, some sort of a process, right? Uh, or a target can be a library, right? So, which can be used by other uh, targets, right? So targets can either be a binary or a library, which can be referenced by other targets. So uh, here I mentioned PEX for Python. So let's, let's uh, talk about uh, what is PEX. So uh, <coughs> PEX is a, uh, Python executable. It's uh, similar in idea to, to what a virtual environment is. Uh, it, so a PEX file is a specially crafted zip file uh, with a Python directive. Uh, so it starts, it, star, it's, it can run anywhere where Python can run. Uh, it basically is a one single file with con which contains all your dependencies, uh, just like, vir 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 like in virtual environment, but you have that one folder. So it's basically a compressed version of your virtual environment. Uh, so you can put this, and it, so it's, it's an immutable artifact, so you can put this uh, in your Docker container uh, and run it, uh, run it on where, anywhere where, uh, where Python can run. Right? So, th so this follows the same ideology that uh, the Docker follows. Right? You create containers, you create immutable containers, and then you destroy them right? whenever you want to change code. So here we are creating immutable artifacts in Python uh, that will run on any server that can run Python. Right? So it, it is a zip file with a Python directive, as I said. Uh, it can also run targets locally uh, without the need of maintaining any uh, complex virtual environments. Uh, so Pants also supports versioning of uh, third-party dependencies. So for example, Flask, r Request, or any of those libraries. Uh, so you can basically uh, do, so all of your projects in that, uh, in that repository can use a standard version of Flask, can use a standard version of uh, of request library, right? And, and you can ensure that uh, all of these, so you basically don't run into surprises because of versions. Uh, let's, let's look at what a, what a build file is. So as I mentioned, uh, it's a pan DSL, but it's essentially a function call in the background. So this is what, uh, the, uh, this is how you build a Python library, right? So for example, my, my folder contains source Python some shared library slash lib.py. Uh, so here, in that build file, this is how I'll define. Uh, I'll define the dependencies as uh, fabric, and then in the source file, uh, I'll say it's, uh, it's a lib.py, and I give it a name called shared lib, which can be referenced by other projects. 
or other uh, targets. Now let's say I want to build a wrapper on top of this uh, uh, Python library. Uh, I want to build a wrapper, uh, a command line interface to this, uh, this library that I made. So all I have to say is Python binary, name CLI. And in the dependencies, you can see that it references shared lib. Right? So you can define uh, complex dependencies, and pants can figure out the dependency path and build the uh, files, in files in order. Uh, so let's. Uh, so this is the uh, build file example. So let let uh, let's go over some examples. So the most common, popular examples are the Twitter Commons repository. So Twitter Commons repository contains uh, basically all the common boilerplate code that was used into inside Twitter, and it's open source. Uh, amongst uh, so it, it basically contains like Zookeeper shared libraries or. Uh, you can, we, we'll, we'll just go over that in a bit. So let me give you a quick demo of, a, of a, like how a simple Python Flask application can be built using uh, uh, Pants. So if, can everybody, everybody see this? It's big enough? Yeah. So I have a repository here. Uh, let me open it here. Right. So ignore the dist folder, because that's where the PEX files are built and stored. Uh, it's actually in also in git ignore. So as I mentioned, there's a source root, so source Python. So I'm so the goal of this is I'm writing a small app that does hello world, and then and then uh, I use a library, shared library, to translate hello world into different languages. Right. So first, let's just look at uh, hello world.py. Uh, so I'm pretty sure a lot of people have used Flask here. This is very simple. So the default route uh, slash is it just returns hello world. And then there's another route slash lang. So you can pass any two character language, like DE for German, uh, uh, ZH for Chinese. Uh, and it will translate uh, to different languages. So you see, I use a from translator import translator, right? So let's, let's look at the translator. So translator is very simple. So it, uh, so it, it maintains a counter of how many times you have translated. So it's just some simple functionality inside it. It uses a third party library called text blob to do the translation. So it returns the counter and just the translated, <coughs> translated message that is passed to it. Right? So, let's, uh, so let's look at the build file for this translator. So as we saw earlier, uh, if you want to build a shared library, uh, this is the build file syntax. So you say Python library name translator, dependencies. So the dependency is a third party Python text blob. Right? So in the third party folder, I've listed all my dependencies. So it's, if you know, notice that's requirements for txt, this is very similar to what you're used to doing in pip. Uh, so so in, in here, I've listed the two dependencies, flask and text blob. Uh, here, I can also sp uh, restrict them to specific versions. So, so all my. Uh, projects, Python projects, will use just a specific version of Flask or a specific version of text blob. Right, so source Python uh, third party text blob. And then globs basically means it finds all the st star.py files inside the current <coughs> directory and concatenates them into a, into a list. So now I want to use this translator library that I just built in, in my hello world. So in the build file here, you will see uh, that I'm using Flask, so third party Flask. And then I'm also using a uh, translator, which lives inside this uh, project. So source equals hello world. Right? So now let's, let's go back uh, to the command line. And let's run uh, pants. So pants is uh, shipped as a, as a bash file. So if you, if you open pants, uh, so it, it invokes pants using bash. Uh, you can go read about the documentation, about the details of how, uh, how it is invoked. So what I'll do, I'll specify a goal that I want to create a binary. And then I'll specify the path. So source, Python, hello world. And I want to create the hello world target. Right? So this will generate the hello world for me. So now it's generated inside dist folder. And this is the pex file. So now when I'll run this pex file, Let's go back to the browser. Uh, so localhost 5000. So that's hello world. 
that's the root. Now let's say I'll translate it to Chinese, so ZH, or uh, I don't know what other languages, MO, I don't know what their language is, DE, German, right? Mm -hmm. So, so it's, a, it's a simple app that is running as a single binary, right? Now I can put this binary inside my Docker container, and all I have, so my Docker file will be very simple, right? From Ubuntu, add hello world.px, run hello world.px, that's all, right? So it's, it's, my Docker file is very simple, it just contains hello world.px. Uh, so one thing that I, uh, so now let's let's see what the pex file is actually. So I can actually do a unzip. So it's, as I said, it's a it's a zip file. So it basically extracted that here. So it so it, pex file is basically just a zip file, uh, and it, it has a directive in the in the start that basically says invoke Python on the main dot py, right? And the main dot py then eventually calls your code. So all the binaries, uh, all the if you see all the dependencies are packed together in the .deps folder. So text blob is here. Uh, all the NLTK, the dependency of text blob. So all the uh, dependencies are packed together in one file, in one <coughs> executable format. So this is uh, very useful when you're deploying uh, services using Docker containers. Uh, so I've built a sample Docker container, but this Docker file is. Uh, So this Docker file is uh, is just an example where I actually build the uh, pex file inside the Docker build command. But ideally, you should just be putting, you should be just be putting, you should be uh, your CI environment should just build the pex file and you should just put it inside the uh, Docker container. So here I basically build it. Uh, it's very simple. Uh, install some dependencies, pants binary, hello world, and then just run hello world pex. So. So this is one example, very simple example. I'll, I'll show you one more example. Uh, uh, so this is uh, this is Wiki's uh, uh, Wiki's actual code production code. This is uh, the operations repository uh, where all the uh, infrastructure related code is. So I'll show you source Python, right? So we have. So this is a. I've taken out some parts from here. Uh, so there's a, so we have the deploy, which is written in fab Fabric. HAProxy is basically some helper tools that we've written around HAProxy, uh, and OpsMaster is just a like a control, like it's a it's a Flask application that uses all of these libraries, right? Uh, Postgres uses all of these libraries. SignalFX uses HAProxy library. So we basically have a lot of code sharing here, uh, and this is facilitated because of Pants. Each of these could have been individual repositories, but I think that would have been very difficult for us to manage. Uh, there are more projects inside this that I've, that I've, that I've uh, extracted out. Uh, so yeah, so that's, uh, now let's, let's also look at, uh, wait. so Twitter, oh sorry, GitHub. So this is Twitter Commons. So this is also another, uh, library. Uh, this is also another uh, mono repo style project uh, where you can reference from uh, if you're trying to build applications using Pants. Uh, so here you can see source. Since it has support for multiple languages, Twitter mainly uses Python and Java. Uh, so you can see there is Java code here that it can build. Uh, there's Python code here. So there's lots of uh, so check style. So have, the benefit of having check style inside the repository where all the code is, that's, that's immense, right? You can uh, enforce standards across all the code that the developers are committing. All right, so, so common, this is all the different, uh, so Confluence, they have some API around Confluence, some decorators that all the other, uh, all the other uh, uh, projects inside this use. So this is just a, so this is probably 10% the size of the actual repository in inside Twitter. There's like hundreds of more projects that use all of these uh, common libraries. So I think uh, that's all for my talk. Uh, I hope you have a good idea about Pants. I'll be happy to take some questions. Have you actually tried putting in the Python? What's the Jython? Jython. Have you tried to no. Try to compile it in Jenkins or something. No. I'm just curious. It seems not. Because it can support the idea and can put Python at the same time. Okay, okay, okay. No, I haven't, I haven't tried Jenkins. Okay.
Um, I was also curious because I just now I saw Coast West, and uh, from the demonstration that you showed, it was relatively um, just Python code. Correct. And I, I was wondering how would a library behave if we have um, like local dynamic library dependencies, for example, um, you need Post West or MySQL um, mm -hmm. header file inside. So it would not, it, it does not package the system dependencies. So system dependencies need to exist on the system. It only packages, just like virtual environment, it only packages the uh, Python dependencies. So this also only packages the Python dependencies. So if we are to use the compiled package to be communicated by the microservice, we need to have the container installed. Correct. So the container needs to set up, uh, like the, uh, I think for Postgres, it will be PostgreSQL common dev or something, right? Yeah. That, that package needs to be installed. So those header files need to be supplied separately. So it does not, so PEX does not fulfill the complete role of what Docker does, right? So it, it, it does, it's not a drop-in replacement for Docker, I'm not saying that. It does not package the full system. It's Python or like the, the languages that it supports. Right? So it, it packages the languages dependencies. But if they have native dependencies, then the system needs to provide those native libraries. What, what server? Whiskey uh, server. I, I'm, I'm not sure. WSGI. WSGI. Yeah. 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 Like so that so that that will come as a separate process, right? So that that you will have to. Uh, so th so. Yeah, that will be a. Uh, I would say. That will have to be handled separately outside of PEX. If unless it is uh, natively Python, unless it is native Python, right? As 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 mentioned earlier. That's all. Cool. All right, thanks, thanks for saying.